Right, well, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, my name's uh, Ian Wright. I'm a professor of planetary sciences at the Open University, which um, I, I'm sure you're probably aware um, was the, uh, the, the, the university that Colin worked at for, for many years. And uh, I, I worked with Colin for all of my professional life. I, um, I um, was a PhD student at Colin's, and uh, I was still having weekly, meeting with him, uh, weekly meetings with him um, uh, up to the, the, you know, the start of last year. Um, and uh, so, so what we're going to be talking about tonight is um, we're going to be talking about this. Um, which is, uh, I hope you all know, is the, is the comet that um, uh, Rosetta has visited. Uh, I don't want to give Matt's talk for him, but I, this, this is one of the most recent images that we've got from the navigation cameras. And uh, the contrast on this has been stretched very, so, so that you can see uh, some of the very faint bits. And a lot of the white specks you can see around here, some of them are artifacts of, of the image processing itself, but most of them are actually lumps of stuff coming off the comet. Um, this is what we wished for, and it's a very dangerous place to be, and uh, we're grateful to have people like Matt uh, sorting it all out for us. Um, we're also going to be talking about this, um, which is the, uh, the Rosetta Stone, uh, which was um, you know, a, a vital ingredient in the um, translation of uh, an understanding of uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, and uh, the, the event we've got tonight is, uh, in some ways, uh, has some parallels with a, uh, an event we did uh, late last year at Kingston Lacey uh, down in um, Dorset. And for those of you who don't know, um, it's, it's a National Trust property, and, and within it, it has an obelisk, and the obelisk is, uh, is the Philae obelisk. And, of course, the, the lander part of the um, Rosetta mission is called Philae. So, um, so it was a fabulous uh, opportunity to sort of bring together uh, the, uh, the colleagues from Oxford who are um, doing some really uh, amazing uh, computer uh, imaging of the hieroglyphics that are actually on this uh, uh, obelisk. And uh, they're, a bit, they're a bit weathered and worn, but they've got some great new digital techniques that are really bit, uh, bringing out the, the hieroglyphics and they're beginning to be able to see things that you, you couldn't have seen previously. So it was a mix of that kind of technology, Egypt, uh, Egyptology and um, digital imaging. And then we were talking about uh, the upcoming landing. I mean, at this point, it hadn't actually happened. And uh, we were kind of um, building up for, for that event. And it was a, a, a fabulous opportunity. And it was very, very well received. There was lots of uh, media attention. And um, we had people like Jonathan Amos down there who, um, who, who was uh, able to cover both aspects of the, uh, of the work. But this is the person we're here to, um, to, to remember this evening. This is Colin Pillinger uh, with Beagle 2. And uh, if I can beg your indulgence for a little while, the evening is about Rosetta. But, of course, Colin is known for his, um, his work leading the Beagle 2 um, project. And... Uh, I, I don't know whether people are aware, but um, actually, we, we found the thing recently uh, after many years. And uh, what we have here are, are three images of the, of, of the site. And if I, if I flick them backwards and forwards, um, what the uh, image processing people will tell you is that they're, they're, they're the same place, but with different uh, illuminations. And there are these bright spots um, in the, in the images that don't change depending on the light. So that means they're very highly reflective and they're very, very flat. In other words, they're, they're completely unnatural as far as uh, uh, Mars itself is concerned. And so um, it, it is thought that uh, these are various uh, bits and pieces from uh, the Beagle 2 spacecraft. Um, and, and so there it is. Um, and uh, it's quite amazing to, uh, to be able to see it after all this time. And so, so what I've done here is I've, I've taken a, a, an image of, of Beagle 2 um, and, I, and I've shrunk it down. I don't know whether you can see that. I've changed the colours a little bit. But I think, uh, I think you can begin to actually think, yes, this, this is definitely it. I mean, over the years, um, we've seen a few of these things and they, they haven't really stood up to scrutiny. But, but this time, we think we've definitely found it for real. And, uh, and, and that's quite amazing. Um, the other really interesting thing about it is that, in actual fact, it looks like the spacecraft has made it down to the surface almost intact. And oddly enough, it's sitting there 
just waiting to be told what to do next. It's not actually impossible. There's some very serious thought going into how the mission itself could be resurrected. And uh, that, that's quite an amazing thing after all this time. But anyway, we're here to talk about Rosetta. Um, this is a, a kind of picture of the Rosetta stone itself. And, and laid on in front of it, there are three uh, images of things of interest to uh, astronomers and planetary sciences. So there's a, there's a star field there. That's actually um, uh, uh, the Halley comet nucleus in the, in the middle. And then the bottom part is, some, is a thin section of rock showing some chondrules. Um, which is a very characteristic uh, um, feature of, uh, of meteorites. And uh, many, many years ago, a, a mission was proposed called Rosetta, and it was actually going to be a comet nuclear sample return mission. We were going to go to a comet, drill down three metres into it, and bring back the sample to Earth for analysis. And this is the front cover of a, of a study that was done on that. Um, it proved to be technologically far too um, difficult and too expensive to do. But this is where the name Rosetta came from. And the, the whole idea was that comets were going to provide us um, with that, that information of the kind that we also got from the Rosetta stone. And it would be absolutely instrumental in our understanding of the, of the solar system and, and how it formed and how it works. Um, and so to Colin, um, I guess many of you know this. Uh, I mean, his, uh, his, his lectures and his talks are, um, are on the Gresham website. You, you can download them, uh, as, as indeed I did. Um, and one of the talks he gave was about hairy stars. Now, the word comet means the hairy one, and so that's what the ancients referred to comets <coughs> as, hairy stars. And this was a talk he gave, look, in, in 1997. And uh, in typical Colin fashion, uh, he started off with some Shakespeare. Um, and he was a very, uh, he was a very eclectic man in his tastes and his and his interests. <laughs> and uh, and he then goes on to talk about some of the things that were known uh, in in the late eighties, uh, the late nineties. And uh, he talks about this ESA uh, space mission, which by now was no longer a sample return mission. It was going to be a mission that was going to a comet you know, on a one way voyage. And, uh, and, he, and, he, and he talks here about how it was given the name Rosetta in honour of the Rosetta Stone and so on. Um, uh, but then he quickly gets back into uh, another passion of his, which is kind of the history around the, around the whole business. And he's talking about Sir William Hamilton, the husband of Lady Hamilton, and Edward Daniel Clark, who was the professor of mineralogy at the University of Cambridge. And these guys were witnesses to the Rosetta Stone being handed over. Uh, and there's a fabulous story there, and I'm, I don't want to steal um, Richard's talk. I'm sure he will, he will be going on about this. Um, but interestingly, there we, we see the name of Thomas Young, who um, was a was a, a physicist uh, and, a, and a physician. Uh, those lovely days when you could do all kinds of things uh, at the same time, and uh, and and he was thought to be quite instrumental in in the translation of the Rosetta Stone. And for those of you who have a science background. Um, you'll know with the name Young in, in context of Young's modulus. It's a, it's a property of, uh, of springs and so on. And, um, and, and so uh, Colin conceived this idea about, um, about actually uh, naming uh, the, the instrument that we were going to send to the comet modulus uh, to commemorate uh, Young's involvement. And uh, modulus stands for Methods of determining and understanding light elements from unequivocal stable isotopic compositions. Now, I could tell you, Colin could never remember what it stood for. <laughs> and whenever he gave a talk, he had to come and ask someone or, or remind himself. Uh, but modulus, Young, uh, in honour of, uh, of Thomas Young. But in actual fact, uh, here is the instrument that we ultimately built, and it's so good that we named it twice. Um, this is actually called Ptolemy, so we, we call the instrument Ptolemy. And, uh, and, and, and what I've got up here is uh, I've, I've just um, sort of overlain uh, a cartouche uh, from the Rosetta Stone, which is actually, it, it, it actually spells the word Ptolemy. And uh, it's one of the things that proved instrumental in terms of, uh, of the translation of the Rosetta Stone. So, so that is our instrument. You can see a hand up there, so there's a few fingers up there for scale, so it's something about that big. It is currently sitting on the, uh, on the comet and uh, it's been making some measurements and uh, we're, we're hoping that uh, uh, the lander will wake up. I'm sure Matt will tell us some more about this. Um, and 
I'll show you some data from the instrument. Uh, that's the kind of stuff we get. That's what we get excited about. I'm sure Matt will have some lovely images of, uh, of the comet, but this, this is what gets us excited. And this is what would have excited Colin. Um, so, yeah, so uh, this is a, 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 the official portrait image that uh, was made of, uh, of Colin uh, when, he, when, he took, when he started at Gresham College. And uh, I, I got a picture here from, from many years later. And, uh, you, you know, in many ways, uh, uh, he didn't change. Uh, of course, um, yeah, things changed enormously in some, in some other ways. But it is, it, it, it's still a tremendous sadness to me that um, he didn't live long enough to actually witness us landing on the comet. And, he, and neither does he, did he, was he around when we found out that Beagle 2 had landed on Mars. So it's a, it, it's a, it's a very strange um, situation for us. Um, but uh, I don't want to end on a, on, on a, on, on a sombre note. So uh, one of his passions was um, collecting cartoons. And uh, uh, Judith tells me this was the last one he ever acquired. And um, you, you'll either get the gag or you won't. Uh, if, you, if you don't get the gag, it will become apparent um, uh, during Matt's talk. <laughs>